I had dinner the other day with somebody who has been raising capital for years and years, uh, you know, very experienced in financial markets, in mineral deposits, in doing cannabis deals and doing all different types of deals. And I've done some good investments with him. And we're at dinner and he asked, say, hey, listen, explain to me crypto. Why should I care? Why do I need crypto, et cetera? And it's an interesting question to ask, okay? And for this topic, what I wanna focus on today is the subject of what we call DAOs, which is Decentralized Autonomous Organizations and why you should care. And I do think that you should care a lot about uh, DAOs or Decentralized Autonomous Organizations because for a lot of the world, they are one of the most wonderful things and show a tremendous amount of promise. We're gonna see you know, how it plays out in practice, but I think it's really, really intriguing. So it's one of the topics that I'm most interested in in kind of this crypto space right now. And so yeah, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about those. So before we do that, if you haven't already, please smash the subscribe button, check, check the little all notifications so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. If you'd like help with forming companies, opening bank accounts, getting residencies, citizenships, tax optimization, asset protection, et cetera. We can help you with the strategy side as well as the implementation. Please reach out to me. You can book a call, calendly.com forward slash Michael Dash Rosmer, link in the description below, or send a message to our websites, offshorecitizen.net and offshorecapitalist.com. Okay, so what are DAOs? Uh, DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. And what is really uh, the deal here? I mean, it's really not that different than a corporation in a certain sense, okay? The difference is that corporations are registered with the state whereas a DAO does not need a state to exist. It is essentially free to create a DAO. It's just created in code. It's just, you know, a entry on a ledger pretty much, okay? Um, but it has digital properties which you can count on and trust and uh, verify, okay? So why is this so important? Well, I'm gonna give you a simple use case that hopefully will explain it. Let's say that you are some kids in Africa, okay? And you wanna start a project. Now you're totally capable of doing it, right? You have the tech skills, the enthusiasm, the marketing, the you know, access to the internet, et cetera, to go and do something. But what's your ability to do this? Well, in your own country, you know, can you form a company? Eh, it's probably kinda of hard, right? It's probably gonna cost a bunch of money. That's kind of a pain in the ass, right? Then, uh, will they allow you based on your age? Well, maybe they won't right? You can do a DAO like that. No problems, okay? What does this suddenly allow you to do? Well, so first of all, these kids basically were able to create something like a company, right? I said a decentralized autonomous organization. What this means that it's decentralized, uh, well, most of them are not actually decentralized, but they call them that, uh, is that the participants run it, okay? So you can be a stakeholder in this and, uh, and run the DAO, okay? Now, there are examples of people from Africa, young people from Africa, who've raised $100 million doing this. Now, here's the thing. You might say this is ridiculous, and to some extent, maybe it is ridiculous, but the technology is enabling something that was never previously possible, okay? Because previously, would you ever invest in some thing in Africa like that? No. Why? Because you can't trust their legal system. Right? You don't know that I'm going to have this enforced. I don't know, whatever. But in a DAO, you can enforce it with code. So you can know exactly what's going to happen. So I can have, for example, a DAO that allocates capital. Okay, so our whole objective is that we are going to uh, have a pool of capital and people can buy into that pool of capital and they can basically be an owner in it. And then by some sort of a voting mechanism, we're going to decide how those funds get allocated. And those funds are gonna remain within the custody of the DAO and they're gonna come back and they're ultimately owned by the DAO owners, right? Well, you don't have to worry about those people taking the money and running off, right? So the concern is, well, I sent the money to the Nigerian prince who's, you know, keeps emailing me, telling me whatever. You don't have to worry about that, right? You can verify this in code what is going on there. And so this attracts lots of money to people that could normally never get money. Now, of course, you have to have a good idea, you have to have a good sales pitch, you have to, you know, people, you have to persuade people to do it. But the difference is, it was just impossible before, right? Like literally, for years and years and years and years, there was an enormous amount of capital in Silicon Valley. And it was basically totally inaccessible unless you actually went to Silicon Valley physically, which you couldn't do because you couldn't get a visa, 
and formed a company there, which you couldn't do because of various other reasons, right? And now all of a sudden you can. You can be sitting at your home anywhere in the world and this props up that opportunity. Next, you are able to give equity to people, essentially, okay, they don't call it equity, but that you can give them shares in the DAO so that you can attract talent, right? So now you can have a small group of people from anywhere in the world with virtually no means who can create one of these things and they can tell people, look, uh, why don't you come and work for my DAO and you're gonna get shares in the DAO as part of it. You're going to be a member of this DAO. You're gonna help to dictate the, and control because we're gonna decide how to govern and direct what changes we make based on voting on chain, okay? And so that means that, you know, what, vote, what we vote into action actually happens in the, in the code. Very, very interesting. Super, super interesting process. This is a massively enabling resource. Then you can ask the question, okay, how can governments go after this, right? How can governments go after it? I mean, they can certainly try. They are, you know, uh, Wyoming has instituted DAO regulation to make a DAO legal entity. And certainly over time, you're probably gonna get some sort of government attempt to tax these things, et cetera. But it's not a legal entity. It's not owned by anybody centrally. It's not, you know, it's very nebulous and difficult to come in at. Even uh, the people who own it typically are not identified. It's just wallet addresses. So who do you go after, right? It's kind of like the new version of the offshore company. So it was back, you know, if we were to go back even like six, seven years ago, you could form anonymous offshore companies, right? It cost you a few thousand dollars. There was a lot of paperwork. It was a pain in the ass, etc. Today, you can go and you can form a DAO like that. And it's in a sense, much better than one of those ever were. It relies on no state. It relies on nobody's permission. And okay, you can't get a bank account for it maybe, but guess what? You can have a wallet address, cryptographic wallet address attached to it immediately with no KYC, no hassle, no whatever. And you know you can argue, okay, this creates a whole bunch of risks for the system and more about anti-money laundering and aren't there gonna be terrorists and blah, 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 right? There might be that, right? There probably over time will be that if it isn't happening already. However, at the same time, there's a whole bunch of people who were excluded from the system, massive amounts of talent that is suddenly being able to be activated, who are suddenly able to get access to resources, who are suddenly able to innovate, who are suddenly able to contribute to projects, who are suddenly able to get paid in return, and so on and so forth. That's a really, really big thing, okay? Very, very big. Next, what's the deal? I have this basic theory which is that uh, the principal two challenges that exist in the world today, kind of like the root cause problems that we as societies are struggling from, is the explosion of scale effects and the explosion of complexity. And our modern day systems are not designed to cope with that increase in scale and complexity. And I'll give you a really simple example. If you go back to 1776, you know, you had the American Revolution, you had the Constitution created out of it, etc., and they built this system of government, right? Uh, it was representational democracy, as they would basically describe it. And that system of representational democracy was based on the idea that you would elect one person who would go and they would act on your behalf, right? And this was somewhat sensible for a couple different reasons. One, it was really difficult. Imagine if you were in Texas and you wanted to have people vote directly. That'd be a problem because how do you even gather these votes and send them to Washington, right? The distance that you have to travel, the time that that's gonna take is totally unreasonable, you can't do it. So you have to kind of somehow compress all of this. At the same time, it made sense because you were in a situation where uh, life was pretty simple. You can go to George Washington's estate and you can take a look around and you can see how these were students of the, uh, of the Enlightenment, these were Renaissance men, they were polymaths. They were people who in their time, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson had the largest library uh, in, the, in the West at the time and he donated it to uh, I think the Library of Congress after his death. And it's like, okay, all of the, these people, they were farmers, they understood farming. They understood business of their time. They were fighters, they understood that. They understood 
uh, you know, they were working on, they were inventors typically. So, you know, they understood something of that. Essentially, you have lived it on this agrarian society that was highly simple, right? What would you do? You would make clothes, uh, make some basic tools, blacksmithing, do some farming, fight. There really wasn't much in the way of medicine. Um, education was extremely primitive, right? There was very little in the way of technology, etc. So it was very reasonable to elect a single representative to go and represent you because that single representative could be an expert in all of the things that affected you, right? Fast forward to today, healthcare, super complex, criminal justice, super complex, military, super complex, education, super complex, sanitation, super complex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Every single field has this monstrous complexity built into it that makes it completely unreasonable that one person can be Honestly, even an expert in one of those areas, let alone all of those areas. But yet we have the same system as we did, you know, a few hundred years ago, right? So what we should be doing, you would think, is we should be running experiments to try and figure out how to innovate our systems of governance and improve them, right? Now we don't do that at all. It's actually extremely calcified and really difficult. And arguably, uh, the modern concept of the nation state is part of what is oppressive over us and that is part of, you know, why we're on this channel to, you know, escape and go and try to access the resources in different parts of the world in order to get some like jurisdictional arbitrage and gain some advantages and build a better life for ourselves, right? You're in a situation where it's unlikely that they're going to do any tests uh, to try and improve this, these systems of governments, uh, because it's just too risky, right? It's too risky, it's too much friction, it's too much whatever. But DAOs can be this place where you can experiment with all different models in a relatively low risk environment and you can iterate extremely quickly. So right now what's happening is really basic. I've done a video on this previously, it's kind of boring, um, but the opportunities to do that and what will happen in terms of innovation over the next you know, several years is phenomenal. Your ability to go and create one yourself and dictate some different game theory rules. Like you could say, okay, it's not one person, one vote. It's, you know, or not one token, one vote. We're gonna say that there's some mathematical formula for this, or you have to spend your votes and you only have so many votes that you can get and you can spend them over time. There's like hundreds of different ways that you could try and play with to see what works. And hopefully we can find some ways that work and then we can scale those up and that's gonna make things better over time, right? Another example of something that is really interesting is uh, you have these DAOs and these DAOs have resources, right? So literally, I mentioned in a previous video, the Uniswap treasury is like over $3 billion, right? It's a lot of money. And the interesting thing is their incentive to spend that money to deploy that capital is very different than what you have in a company. So in a company, you have fiduciary responsibility to shareholders of the directors and so they can't just randomly throw out money to projects, okay? Because they're in a situation where their legal obligation is to maximize shareholder value, right? And this is, it, it, there's a reason that it's there, but it's also deeply debilitating. So you see these huge companies that just have $100 billion in cash that they're doing basically nothing with, right? If you have Google, they have Google Labs, and really for them to invest, they have to be thinking about this ROI perspective. And as a result, a lot of kind of risky bets that probably should get done because you have an abundance of resources don't get done, okay? The types of things that an individual who was empowered would maybe go and try, they're not gonna try because they're concerned about this, right? Well, in a DAO, you don't have that same incentive structure. So you can have a pool of capital that the incentive structure is, hey, let's just fund this because we think it's a good idea, because we think it's cool, because it fits with our mission, because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and that can be community driven, and there's lots of different ways of distributing that and figuring those things out, et cetera. So uh, it potentially really flattens the funding environment and allows a lot of projects that are great projects that aren't currently getting funded to get funded, okay? So that's something that's really interesting. The last thing I think is super interesting is I've been thinking quite a lot over the last while about innovation and how do you tend to, as an organization grows, the level of innovation tends to decrease. Uh, the level of innovation society-wide is pretty disappointing, I would argue. And yet, this is concerning because if you look at the number one thing that has improved the world and improved the lives of people is technology, right? If you were to go and you were to flash back 100 years, 
you could say the richest person 100 years ago, uh, his life was in most respects much worse than the average person in the West today. That's quite a change. Why is that? It's not because governments are so great. It's not because of handouts or welfare or something like this. It's because of technology. We have technology that has improved. And so the natural corollary of this is if I want to move things forward and improve them, I want to innovate and come up with new technology and better, etc. But yet it seems like organizations as they grow stifle this sort of innovation. Well, the interesting thing is DAOs are much more participatory. So their structure is not like a traditional business. Uh, it's more about having the community engaged in this project. And so potentially, we'll see how it works, but potentially this allows a different type of scalability that may be able to keep the incentive structure for innovation strong even as it grows. I had somebody I was talking to the other day who likened it, if you uh, understand things about uh, database technology and, uh, well, I mean in general, cloud infrastructure, etc. There's this concept of vertical scaling or horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling is you use bigger and bigger machines uh, and horizontal scaling is you basically use more and more machines. And the way that we build organizations right now is based on this bigger and bigger machines approach. DAOs potentially can allow us to do horizontal scalability across getting work done, which could be really, really fascinating. We're gonna see how it actually works in practice, but, uh, but it's an exciting area. So why do I mention all this? Is because I think it's an area that you should be interested in. Uh, what's the value of these DAO tokens? We're gonna see, right? There may be some investment opportunities there that uh, certainly there's lots of them out there right now and maybe they're gonna turn into something, maybe they aren't. But I think it's really useful to be aware of because in the future, instead of, you know, here we talk about forming companies and opening bank accounts, et cetera, you may want to start a DAO instead of forming a company. You may want to just use a digital wallet rather than opening a bank account because why deal with the friction that's created by all this nonsense from governments and the banking sector, et cetera. So anyway, I hope it helps. Hope it's interesting to you. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you like any of this stuff, follow me on Twitter, at Michael Rosmer, and I'm gonna look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.